Chapter Two of Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Two: A Downing Street Sensation. Me ride eight miles on an horse! Exclaimed Bindle, looking up at the foreman in surprise. And who's a comin' to old me on? Bindle stood in the yard of Monsieur's Impson and Daly cartage contractors regarding a pair of burly cart horses ready harnessed with the traces thrown over their backs the foreman explained in the idiom adopted by foreman that orders is orders you can ride on top run beside or hang on behind but you gotta be at merton at twelve o'clock he said we just had a telephone message that a van's stranded this side o merton horses broken down and you and Tippet have got to take these ere and deliver the goods. Then take the van where you're told, and bring back them ruddy horses here, and don't you forget it. Bindle scratched his head through the blue and white cricket cap he habitually wore. Horses had suddenly assumed for him a new significance. With elaborate intentness he examined the particular animal that had been assigned to him what part do you sit on old son he inquired of tippet a pale weedy youth with a thin dark moustache that curled into the corners of his mouth tippet's main characteristic was that he always had a cigarette either stuck to his lip or behind his ear sometimes both on his tail replied tippet laconically his cigarette wagging up and down as he spoke sit on his what cried bindle walking round to the stern of his animal and examining the tail with great attention sit on his what on his tail repeated tippet without manifesting any interest in the conversation right back on his haunches he added by way of explanation more comfortable oh said bindle relieved i see pity you can't say what you mean tippy ain't it personally myself i'd sooner sit well up so as i could put me arms round his neck hi spotty he called to an unprepossessing stable hand bring a ladder a uh, what inquired spotty dully a ladder explained bindle i got to mount this ere derby winner spotty strolled leisurely across the yard towards bindle and for a moment stood regarding the horse in a detached sort of way i'll give you a leg up mate he said accommodatingly bindle looked at the horse suspiciously and seeing there were no indications of vice at the same time realizing that there was nothing else to be done he acquiesced steady on old sport he counselled spotty don't you chuck me clean over the other side with a dexterous heave spotty landed him well upon the animal's back bindle calmly proceeded to throw one leg over sitting astride not that way said tippet both legs on the near side you can ride your nag what way you like tippy said bindle but as for me i likes to have a leg on each side how the ell am i going to old on if i sit like a bloomin lady my god he exclaimed passing his hand along the backbone of the animal if i don't have a cushion i shall wear through in two licks here spotty give us a cloth of some sort then you can back me as a two to one chance tippet more accustomed than bindle to such adventures vaulted lightly upon his animal and led the way out of the yard for some distance they proceeded at an ambling walk which bindle found in no way inconvenient just as they had entered the fulham road where it branches off from brompton road an urchin gave bindle's horse a flick on the flank with a stick sending it into a ponderous trot amidst the jangling clatter of harness bindle clutched wildly at the collar here stop him somebody hold him he yelled i touched the wrong button whoa steady whoa old iron he shouted then turning his head to one side he called out tippy tippy where the hell is the brake for god's sake stop him before he shakes me into a jelly tippet's animal jangled up beside that on which bindle was mounted and both once more fell back into the ponderous slope at which they had started with great caution bindle raised himself into an upright position i wonder what made him do a thing like that he said reproachfully bruised me all over he has i shan't be able to sit down for a month here stop him tippy i'm getting orf 
Tippet stretched out his hand and brought both horses to a standstill. Bindle slipped ungracefully over his animal's tail. "'You can have him, Tippy, old sport. I'm going to walk,' he announced. "'When I get tired of walking, I'll get on a bus. I'll meet you at Wimbledon Common.' And Tippet, his cigarette hanging loosely from a still looser lower lip, reached over, caught the animal's bridle, and, without comment, continued on his way westward. "'Well, live and learn,' mumbled Bindle to himself. "'I don't care what a jockey gets, but he earns it every penny. Fancy an horse being as hard as that. Catch you up presently, Tippy,' he cried. "'Mind you don't fall off!' And Bindle turned into the dragon hounds, "'for something to take the bruises out,' as he expressed it to himself. "'Catch me a riding of an horse again without an air cushion,' he muttered as he came out of the public bar wiping his mouth. He hailed a westbound bus, and, climbing on the top and lighting his pipe, proceeded to enjoy the morning sunshine. When Tippet reached the extreme end of Wimbledon Common, Bindle rose from the grass by the roadside where he had been leisurely smoking and enjoying the warmth. "'Add quite a pleasant little snooze, Tippy,' he yawned as he stretched his arms behind his head. "'Wonder who first thought of riding on an horse's back,' he yawned. "'As for me, I'd just as soon ride on an end saw.' They jogged along in the direction of Merton, Bindle walking beside the horses, Tippet silent and apathetic, his cigarette still attached to his lower lip. "'You ain't what I should call a chatty cove, Tippy,' remarked Bindle conversationally. "'But then,' he added, "'that has its points. If you don't open your mouth, no woman can't say you ever asked her to marry you, can she?' "'Married, mate,' Tippet vouchsafed the information without expression or interest. Bindle stood still and looked at him. Tippet unconcernedly continued on his way. "'Well, I'm damned,' remarked Bindle, as he continued after the horses. "'Well, I'm damned. They'd get you if you was deaf and dumb and blind. Poor old Tippy, no wonder he looks like that.' Just outside Merton they came upon a stranded pantechnicon. Drawn up in front of it was a motor-car containing two ladies. "'This the little lot?' inquired Bindle, as they pulled up beside the vehicle which bore the name of John Smith and Company, Merton. "'Are you all from Empson and Daly's?' inquired the elder of the two ladies, a sallow-faced, angular woman with pince-nez. "'That's us, Mum,' responded Bindle. "'I suppose those are the horses,' remarked the same lady, indicating the animals with an inclination of her head. "'You ain't got much to learn in the way of guessin', Mum,' was Bindle's cheery response. The lady eyed him disapprovingly. Her companion at the wheel smiled. She was younger. Bindle winked at her, but she froze instantly. "'The horses that were in this van were taken ill,' said the lady. "'What, both together, mum?' exclaimed Bindle. "'Yes,' replied the lady, looking at him sharply. "'Must have been twins or conchies.' Footnote. Conscientious objectors to military service. End of footnote was bindle's explanation of the phenomenon if one of ginger's twins as the measles sure as eggs the other'll get em on the next day that's what makes ginger so ratty bindle walked up to the van and examined it as if to assure himself that it was in no way defective and where are we to take it mum he inquired to mr llewellyn john number one ten downing street was the reply bindle whistled he ain't movin is he mum the van contains a presentation of carved oak dining-room furniture she added and very nice too was bindle's comment outside downing street she continued you will be met by a lady who will give you the key that opens the doors of the van hadn't we better take the key now mum bindle inquired you'll do as you're told please was the uncompromising rejoinder right o mum remarked bindle cheerily now then tippy let's get these ere horses in which end do you begin on tippet and bindle silently busied themselves in harnessing the horses to the pantechnicon no you won't make any mistake said the lady when everything was completed number one ten downing street mr llewellyn john there ain't going to be no mistakes mum you may put your end on your art bindle assured her coffee money mum inquired tippet it's ot tippet never wasted words tippy tippy i'm surprised at you bindle turned upon his colleague reproachfully 
only twice have you spoke to-day and the second time's to beg oh, i'm sorry mum he said turning to the lady it ain't his fault it's just abbott the lady hesitated for a moment then taking her purse from her bag handed bindle a two shilling piece tippet eyed it greedily with a final admonition not to forget the lady drove off bindle looked at the coin spat on it and put it in his pocket funny thing how a woman'll give a couple of bob where a man'll make it half a dollar he remarked what about me inquired tippet what about you tippy repeated bindle well least said soonest mended you can't help it but i asked her persisted tippet ah tippy remarked bindle it ain't im what asks but im what gets however you shall ave a stone ginger at the next stoppin place your old pal ain't going back on you tippy without a word tippet climbed up into the driver's seat whilst bindle clambered on to the tailboard where he proceeded to fill his pipe with the air of a man for whom time has no meaning good job they ain't all like me he muttered i likes a day in the country now and then but always not me he struck a match, lighted his pipe, and with a sigh of contentment composed himself to bucolic meditation. One of the advantages of the moving profession in Bindle's eyes was that it gave him hours of leisured ease whilst the goods were in transit. "'You can slack it like a Cuthbert,' he would say. "'All you got to do is sit on the tail of a van and watch the world go by. Some life that!' bindle was awakened from his contemplation of the hedges and the white road that ribboned out before his eyes by a man coming out of a gate at the sight of the pantechnicon he grinned and with a jerk of his thumb indicated the van as if it were the greatest joke in the world bindle grinned back although not quite understanding the cause of the man's amusement up little lot that mate remarked the man stepping off the curb and walking beside the tailboard bindle looked at him puzzled at the remark what actually might you be meaning old son he inquired oh come orf it said the man i won't tell your missus like a razzle myself sometimes and he laughed obviously amused at this joke bindle slipped off the tailboard and joined the man who had returned to the pavement you evidently seen a joke what's caught me on the blind side he remarked casually a joke remarked the man a whole van load of jokes if you was to ask me well perhaps you're right remarked bindle philosophically but if there's as many as all that i should have thought there'd have been enough for two but as i say perhaps you're right these ain't the times for giving anything away although he added meditatively i adn't heard of their having rationed jokes as well as meat and sugar we shall be avin joke cues soon he added you seem to be a sort of joke og you do bindle turned and regarded his companion with interest you mean to say that you don't know what's inside that there van inquired the man incredulously carved oak dining-room furniture i been told replied bindle indifferently the man laughed loudly then turned to bindle you mean to say you don't know that van's full of gals he demanded full o what exclaimed bindle coming to a dead stop his astonishment was too obvious to leave doubt in the man's mind as to its genuineness gals and women he replied saw em gettin in down the road out of motors dressed in white they was with coloured sashes over their shoulders suffragettes i should say they didn't see me though he added bindle gave vent to a low prolonged whistle as he resumed his walk old me orus he cried happily what did mrs b say if she knew suddenly he paused again and slapped his knee well i'm damned he cried a raid of course the man looked anxiously up at the blue of the sky it's all right said bindle reassuringly my mistake it was a bird a few minutes later the man turned off from the main road oi tippy bindle hailed don't you forget that stone ginger at the next dairy a muttered reply came from tippet five minutes later he drew up outside a public house on the outskirts of wimbledon bindle took the opportunity of climbing up on the top of the van where he gained the information he required every inch of the roof was perforated airolds he muttered with keen satisfaction airolds as i'm a miserable sinner and he clambered down and entered the public bar where he convinced tippet that his mate should be trusted with money
when bindle had drained the last drop of his second pewter his mind was made up number one ten downing street he muttered white dresses and coloured sashes that's it well joe bindle you can't save the bloomin british empire from destruction but you can save the prime minister from having his afternoon nap spoilt leastwise you can try i'm a-goin for a little stroll tippy he remarked as he walked towards the door back in ten minutes if you gets lonely order another pint and put it down to me right oh mate replied tippet bindle walked along wimbledon high street and turned into an oil shop do you keep lamp black he inquired of the young woman behind the counter yes she replied how much do you want we sell it in packets let's have a look at a packet said bindle when he had examined it he ordered two more startin a minstrel troupe he confided to the young woman but you want burnt cork she said practically lamp black's greasy you'll never get it off that's just why i want it remarked bindle with a grin the young woman looked at him curiously and when he had purchased a pea puffer as well she decided that he was a harmless lunatic but took the precaution of testing the half crown he tendered by ringing it on the counter shouldn't be surprised if we was to have an heavy shower of rain in a few minutes remarked bindle loudly a few minutes later as he rejoined tippet who was engaged in watering the horses tippet looked at bindle his cigarette wagging then turning his eyes up to the cloudless sky in surprise he finally reached the same conclusion as the young woman in the oil shop now up you get tippy admonished bindle and there's another drink for you at the green lion bindle knew his london as the pantechnicon rumbled heavily along by the side of wimbledon common bindle whistled softly to himself the refrain of the end of a happy day whilst tippet was enjoying his fourth pint that morning at the green lion bindle borrowed a large watering can which was handed up to him on the roof of the pantechnicon by a surprised barman bindle emptied the contents of one of the packets of lamp black into the can and started to stir it vigorously with a piece of twig he had picked up from the side of the common when the water had reluctantly absorbed the lamp black to bindle's entire satisfaction he called out loudly oh, i knew we was going to have a shower and he proceeded to water the top of the pantechnicon now i must put this ere tarpaulin over or else the water'll get through them holes he said he clearly heard suppressed exclamations as the water penetrated inside the van having emptied the can he proceeded to drag the tarpaulin over the roof leaving uncovered only a small portion in the centre the barman of the green lion had been watching bindle with open-mouthed astonishment what the hell are you up to mate he whispered bindle put his forefinger of the right hand to the side of his nose and winked mysteriously then going inside the green lion he in a way that did not outrage the regulations that there should be no treating had tippet's tankard refilled and called for another for himself if you watch the papers bindle remarked to the barman i shouldn't be surprised if you was to see what i was a-doin on the top of that there van and again he winked the barman looked from bindle to tippet then touching his forehead with a fugitive first finger and glancing in the direction of bindle made it clear that another was prepared to support the diagnosis of the young woman at the oil shop bindle completed the journey on the top of the van industriously occupied in puffing lamp black through the holes in the roof his method was to dip the end of the pea puffer in the packet then insert it in one of the holes and give a sharp puff this he did half a dozen times in quick succession then he would pause for a few minutes to allow the lamp black to settle he argued that if he puffed it all in at once it would in all probability choke the occupants by the time they turned from king's road into ebury street bindle's task was accomplished the lamp black was exhausted victoria station he called out loudly to tippet shan't be long now mate another shower a-comin better cover up these bloomin holes and he drew the tarpaulin over the rest of the roof let em stew a bit now he mumbled to himself that'll make em ought he had been conscious of suppressed coughing and sneezing from within which he detected by placing his ear near the holes in the roof opposite the houses of parliament a lady came up to mendel and handed him a key this is the key of the pantechnicon she said loudly you are not to undo it until you reach number one ten downing street do you understand 
right o remarked bindle i got it now don't forget said the lady and she disappeared swiftly in the direction of victoria street no i ain't going to forget murmured bindle to himself and i shouldn't be surprised if there was others what ain't going to forget either he watched the lady who had given him the key well out of sight then slipping off the tailboard of the van he walked swiftly along whitehall a few yards south of downing street an inspector of police was meditatively contemplating the flow of traffic north and south bindle went up to him pretend that i'm asking the way sir i'm most likely being watched i got a van what's supposed to contain carved oak furniture for mr llewellyn john one ten downing street i think it's full of suffragettes going to raid him you get your men round there the van'll be up in two ticks now point as if you was showing me downing street the inspector was a man of quick decision and looking keenly at bindle decided that he was to be trusted right he said then extending an official arm pointed out downing street to bindle don't hurry he added right o said bindle joseph bindle's my name i'm a special fulham district the inspector nodded and bindle turned back to the van a moment later the inspector strolled leisurely through the archway leading to the foreign office that's downing street on the left shouted bindle to tippet as he came up much to tippet's surprise he was at a loss to account for many things that bindle had done and said that day as they turned into downing street bindle was a little disappointed at finding only two constables but he was relieved a moment later by the sight of the inspector to whom he had spoken hurrying through the archway leading from the foreign office where are you going to called out the inspector to tippet taking no notice of bindle tippet jerked his thumb in the direction of bindle who came forward at that moment number one ten downing street sir responded bindle some furniture for mr llewellyn john right said the inspector loudly but you'll have to wait a few minutes until the motor car is gone bindle winked as a sign of his acceptance of the mythical motor car and drawing the key of the pantechnicon from his pocket showed it to the inspector who by closing his eyes and slightly bending his head indicated that he understood tippet had decided that everybody was mad this morning the police inspector's reference to a motor car outside number one ten whereas his eyes told him that there was nothing there but roadway and dust had seriously undermined his respect for the metropolitan police force however it was not his business he was there to drive the horses who in turn drew a van to a given spot there his responsibility ended after a wait of nearly ten minutes the inspector reappeared it's all clear now he remarked draw up as the pantechnicon pulled up in front of number one ten bindle glanced up at the house and saw mr llewellyn john looking out of one of the first floor windows he had evidently been apprised of what was taking place bindle noticed that the doors of number one ten and one eleven were both ajar he was however a little puzzled at the absence of police the two uniformed constables had been reinforced by three others and there were two obviously plain-clothes men loitering about now then tippy get ready to lend me a and with this ere furniture called out bindle as he proceeded to insert the key in the padlock that fastened the doors of the van tippet who had climbed down was standing close to the tailboard facing the doors with a quick movement bindle released the padlock from the hasp and lifting the bar stepped aside with an agility that was astonishing votes for women votes for women votes for women suddenly the placid quiet of downing street was shattered the doors of the pantechnicon were burst open and thrown back upon their hinges where they shivered as if trembling with fear from the interior of the van poured such a stream of humanity as downing street had never before seen following bindle's lead the inspector had taken the precaution of stepping aside but tippet unconscious that the van contained anything more aggressive than carved oak furniture was in the direct line of exit at the moment the doors flew open he was in the act of removing his coat and with his arms entangled in the sleeves sat down with a suddenness that caused his teeth to rattle and his cigarette to fall from his lower lip synchronizing with the opening of the doors of the pantechnicon was a short sharp blast of a police whistle the effect was magical men seemed to pour into downing street from everywhere 
from the archway leading to the foreign office up the steps from green park from whitehall and out of numbers one ten and one eleven plain clothes and uniformed police seemed to spring up from everywhere but no one took any notice of the fall of tippet all eyes were fixed upon the human avalanche that was pouring from the inside of the pantechnicon for once in its existence the metropolitan police force was rendered helpless with astonishment women they had expected women they were prepared for but the extraordinary flood of femininity that cascaded out of the van absolutely staggered them there were short women and tall women stout women and thin women young women and well women not so young the one thing they had in common was a lamp black it was smeared upon their faces streaked upon their garments it had circled their eyes marked the lines of their mouths had collected round their nostrils the heat inside the pantechnicon had produced the necessary moisture upon the fair faces and with this the lamp black had formed an unholy alliance hats were awry hair was dishevelled frocks were limp and bedraggled the cries of votes for women that had heralded the triumphant outburst from the van froze upon their lips as the demonstrators caught sight of one another each gazed at the others in mute astonishment whilst tippet from his seat in the middle of the roadway stared wondering in a stupid way whether what he saw was the heat or the five pints of ale he had consumed at bindle's expense during the morning the inspector looked at bindle curiously and bindle looked at the inspector with self-satisfaction whilst the constables discovered that their unhappy anticipation of a rough-and-tumble with women a thing they disliked had been turned into a most delectable comedy at the first floor window mr llewellyn john watched the scene with keen enjoyment for a full minute the women stood gazing from one to the other in a dazed fashion finally one with stouter heart than the rest shouted votes for women this is a woman's war but there was no answering cry from the ranks slowly it dawned upon each and every woman that in all probability she was looking just as ridiculous as those she saw about her one girl produced a small looking-glass from a handbag she gave one glance into it and incontinently went into hysterics flopping down where she stood the public conscious that great events were happening in downing street poured into the narrow thoroughfare and the laughter denied the official police by virtue of discipline was heard on every hand christy minstrels ain't they inquired one youth of another with ponderous humour it was at that moment that one of them had raised a despairing cry of votes for women and had received no support votes for women remarked one man shrewdly soap for women is what they want fancy coming out like that even in war time commented another how'd they get like that inquired a third oh, you never know them suffragettes remarked a fourth sagely they're always out for doing something different from what's been done before well they done it this time commented a little man with grey whiskers enough to make god himself ashamed of us them women is bah and he spat contemptuously the inspector felt that the time for action had arrived walking up to the unhappy group of twenty he remarked in his most official tone you cannot stand about here you must be moving on moving on but where they looked into each other's eyes mutely suddenly an idea seemed to strike them and they turned instinctively to re-enter the van but bindle had anticipated this manoeuvre and had carefully closed barred and padlocked the doors the inspector nodded approval he had formed a very high opinion of bindle's powers although greatly puzzled by the whole business at a signal from their superior a number of uniformed constables formed up behind the forlorn band of females several of whom were in tears move along there please they chorused dexterously splitting up the group into smaller groups and finally into ones and twos thus they were herded towards whitehall will you call some cabs please said she who was obviously the leader the inspector shook his head whereat the woman smacked the face of the nearest constable obviously with the intention of being arrested again the inspector shook his head he had made up his mind that there should be no arrests that day nemesis had taken a hand in the game and the inspector recognized in her one who is more powerful than the metropolitan police force slowly amidst the jeers of the crowd the twenty women were shepherded into whitehall 
oh please get me a taxi appealed the little blonde woman with a hard mouth and what looked like a dark black moustache i cannot go about like this suddenly one of their number was taken with shrieking hysterics she sat down suddenly giving vent to shriek after shriek and beating a tattoo with the heels of her shoes upon the roadway but no one took any notice of her and soon she rose and followed the others in whitehall frantic appeals were made to drivers of taxicabs and conductorettes of omnibuses none would accept such fares it'd take a month to clean my bloomin cab after you been in it shouted one man derisively what yer want to get yourself in such a dirty mess for go home and wash the baby shouted another nowhere did the black and white raiders find sympathy or assistance two of the leaders of the suffragette movement who happened to be passing down whitehall were attracted by the crowd on learning what had happened and seeing the plight of the demonstrators they continued on their way this is war time one of them remarked to the other and they're disobeying the rules of the association with this they were left to their fate some made for the tube others for the district railway whilst two sought out a tea-shop and demanded washing facilities but were refused the railway stations were their one source of hope for the next three hours passengers travelling to wimbledon were astonished to see entering the train forlorn and dishevelled women whose faces were rendered hideous by smears of black and whose white frocks limp and crumpled looked as if they had been used to clean machinery a pleasant little afternoon's treat for you sir remarked bindle to the inspector when the last of the raiders had disappeared mr john seemed to enjoy it bindle indicated the first floor window of number one ten with a jerk of his thumb was that your doing inquired the inspector well replied bindle it was and it wasn't and he explained how it had all come about and what am i going to do with this ere van he queried better run it round to the yard then you can take home the horses replied the inspector right o said bindle by the way added the inspector i'm coming round myself i should like you to see chief inspector gunny bindle nodded cheerily ullo tippy he cried knocked you down didn't they tippet grinned he had thoroughly enjoyed the entertainment and bore no malice that's why you got the watering can mate he remarked bindle surveyed him with mock admiration now ain't you clever he remarked fancy you a seein that there ain't no spots on you tippy whereat tippet grinned again modestly that afternoon bindle was introduced to the famous chief inspector gunny of scotland yard who for years previously had been the head of the department dealing with the suffragist demonstrations he was a genial large-hearted man who had earned the respect almost the liking of those whose official enemy he was when he heard bindle's story he roared with laughter and insisted that bindle should himself tell about the black and white raiders to the deputy commissioner and the chief constable it was nearly four o'clock when bindle left scotland yard smoking a big cigar with which the deputy commissioner had presented him chief inspector gunny's last words had been well bindle you've done us a great service if at any time i can help you let me know now i wonder what he meant by that murmured bindle to himself does it mean that i can have a little flutter at bigamy or that i can break artie's bloomin ed and not get pinched for it still he remarked cheerfully it's been an happy day a very happy day and he turned in at the feathers and ordered something to wet this ere cigar end of chapter two read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com